It is great to gather together on a morning like this. Because it's on a morning like this that we are able to rejoice in an event like no other. I want you to really grasp the idea that the disciples knew that Jesus was going to change things. He changed them. He, he changed the world around them. Not only the miraculous healings of people, but the internal change that took place in lives. Every life that he touched was eternally changed. Some received, some rejected, but none, none could leave him unchanged. No one could face the Lord Jesus and not be altered. Some ran away stubbornly, some embraced him, but everyone changed. Put yourself, again, in the shoes of the disciples. Help yourself try to understand what it is to be a disciple who is weary, to be a disciple who is uncertain, to be a disciple who's really not sure what comes next. But then there is this beautiful, beautiful first day of the week. There's this day where we are going to discover that God has taken the world as we know it and turned it on its head. That he is saying that I am making the things that are impossible, possible. That I am taking very death itself and conquering it by death, my death. But death does not have the last word. And so we find this great event where the disciples are gathered and they're scared to death. Jesus has been crucified. The Roman officials, the Jewish leaders have won from a human perspective. So they're gathered in a room. They're praying. They're frantic. Perhaps they're arguing. And they are there together. Together, I like that. Ten of them at least. One has taken his own life, and one is absent. And I want us to pick up with this story as we discover this gathering of confused disciples. Chapter 20 of John, beginning in verse 19. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were, and I put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. On a day like this, we gather and we try to understand what it's like to be one of those men. We see them gathered and Jesus appears. And it's a week later. And the disciples have already told Thomas that they have seen the Lord. But as we can imagine, this is a difficult thing to believe. And so Thomas says, I want proof. I want tangible evidence that Jesus Christ is alive. 
And before we ridicule him, we again try to think, what would it be like to hear that your teacher, that your Savior, who you saw or knew had been crucified, had been nailed to a cross, had died, had been buried. Now they have, been to- they have told Thomas, he's alive. Remember, they have seen him. He entered their room. They saw him. They had the tangible ed- evidence, but Thomas did not. And so he says, I simply cannot believe this, and I will not believe this unless I see it, unless I touch him, unless I see those scars. Now, I've got lots of questions in this text. I've got lots of questions. I wonder what Thomas felt. Today, in addition to being Easter, is another day. I hate that part of this day. See, I don't like tricks. I don't like pranks. Please don't try one. I I wonder if Thomas felt a little bit like someone was trying to treat him like a fool. You really expect me to believe this? Do, Do I really, really have friends that are trying to give me this message that that simply cannot be true? Another question I have: why did Jesus wait a week? Why a week? Picture this. He has been told by his friends, truly, Jesus is alive. We saw him. And Thomas is saying, well, I haven't seen him. And it's been a full week. Why did Jesus not show up before then? We don't have the answer. We know it's intentional. We know he waited intentionally as his friend Lazarus died. But Thomas, why in the world did he wait a week? I don't know the answer to that question. All I know, again, as it says, a week later, his disciples were in the house again. Now, as I look at this text, I am am drawn into another question. And this question is this, how did Jesus respond in the way that he did? Not how, as in, what did he say? We already know that. The scripture says it. But how did he do this? How did he actually find the words to say? You see, I expect Jesus to say something different. I expect Jesus to not bring in the words that he brought. What are those words? Well, he says peace. A week later, verse 26, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. The doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here, my, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Now, it would be logical. It would be understandable if we were to say, I think Jesus is going to come in and rebuke Thomas. That would make a whole lot more sense to me. He's already said peace to his disciples, the ten But even to Thomas, he comes and he says, peace be with you. Thomas, peace be with you. Why did Jesus choose these words? Why did Jesus come to him with such words? Why did Jesus not rebuke him for his doubt? Well, Thomas was not alone. We return to chapter 16. We hear a very similar story. Jesus says to all of the disciples, verse 32, a time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Here is the words of Jesus saying to the disciples, every one of them, you will flee, you will scatter. We've seen Judas, the ultimate scatterer. We've seen Peter deny Jesus three times. We, we see Thomas who is doubting that Jesus is alive. We see the disciples a week after they've seen Jesus still locked in a room fearful. Don't miss that part. A week before, they have seen Jesus alive. They have seen their Lord victorious. And a week later, they're still locked up in a room. 
scared to death. Even John. You see, John is the one that actually looks like he's going to be faithful all the way through. John is the one who is at the foot of the cross. John is the one who knew the high priest. He's able to get into Judas' trial. He got Peter in as well. John looks like the one who's always going to be faithful. John is the one who Jesus says, look, mom, this is your son. Look, John, this is your mom. John was there. But even John is locked in a room a week after he's seen the risen Lord, scared to death to do anything about his faith, to do anything about the resurrection. He's locked away. And Jesus says, Jesus says days before, I tell you the truth, the time is coming when you will all scatter, every single one of you. You will go to your own home, you'll be, fear, you'll be fearful, you will fall away. But, but, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. As I think, as I think about these stories, as I think about these ten men, plus another week later, have now seen the G- Jesus as we know him, as the resurrected Lord, I think about the story in between, and it takes me to a man named Paul, a man who was an enemy of Christ, an enemy of church, of the church, yet he found by the blinding of Jesus, that blinding that gave him sight, he was able to see that Jesus truly came to do something great. And one of my favorite phrases that Paul writes about in the scripture is this, Christ Jesus came to save sinners. Christ Jesus came to save sinners. Makes you think of the words of Jesus long before Paul spoke. I've come for the sick, not the healthy. And I begin to make sense of the story of Thomas. I begin to make sense of the other ten. And I begin to see what is going on here. You see, Jesus says, I have come to give you peace. I'm telling you this ahead of time so you will have peace. I'm telling you that even you reject me, I am not alone because the Father is with me. I'm telling you these things so you will have peace. And so the great message we have on a Sunday like this is that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. One like me, one like you. We are sinners in need of Jesus Christ. Now think about who's in that room. Just for a sampling, we have Peter. He's the one, remember, that denied Jesus three times. Jesus told him would, told him he would. Peter said, no, Lord, I'll even die for you. As rooster crows, Peter knows the words of Jesus are true. And his failure is true. But Peter goes on to be a great evangelist. A great church leader, one who reaches out with the gospel. A guy named Matthew, he's another one of the 12. He's locked in the room, fearful. John, just like him, fearful. And those two would go on to write two of the gospels that we have in Scripture one from which I read today, these men who doubted Jesus, God entrusted them with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to write Scripture. We see that these men actually found something within them that said, I can overcome my past. I can overcome my fear. I can overcome my doubt. I can overcome those things that I did not do. James. Remember James? Brother of John? John? Scripture tells us that James, one who is fearful, one who is fearful of the Jews, fearful of the Romans, locked once and locked again a week later out of fear. He's later locked up only to have his head cut off with a saw because he would not deny the Lord Jesus. But what about Thomas? What does Thomas do? What what does this story do to Thomas? We'll go back to the text, John chapter 20, and we read verse 27 and 28. Then he, Jesus, said to Thomas, put your fingers here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Thomas is the very first disciple 
to understand the true identity of Jesus Christ. Every single one of them prior to this has already called him Lord, Rabbi, Master, Teacher. But Thomas, Thomas, after given the second chance, after given the opportunity to actually touch and see what he demanded to touch and see in order for him to believe, Jesus grants him this out of his grace, and Jesus brings his word and says, peace be with you. And therefore, in some way, through the power of the Spirit, Thomas is able to understand that he's looking God in the face. And so Thomas says, not only my Lord, not only my teacher, not only my rabbi, but my Lord and my God. When we face our past, when we face what we did, and perhaps what you are doing, if you've not yet come to Christ, if you've not yet actually believed that he is alive, we are in what I would call Thomas's seven days. Remember, there was a week. I wonder what Thomas thought. I wonder what was going on. We know he didn't believe yet. I don't know if he's angry at himself. I don't know if he's jealous that he wasn't there. I don't know if he's angry with his other friends, his fellow disciples. But we know that he had a week where his mind was just in a mess. And I wonder on this day if you find yourself with a mind in the mess. I wonder if you find yourself with a heart that is discontent. I wonder even if you are a believer, you find yourself in a moment of doubt. Not that Jesus is Lord, not that Jesus is alive. You you believe those things, but that you actually struggle with believing Jesus. Not believing in him, but believing him. Believing him when he says, come unto me and I will give you rest. Believing him when you say, take my burden for it is light. To believe the testimony of scripture that says, do not worry about tomorrow. Each day has enough trouble of its own. When Jesus says, it's okay, I've got this. When Jesus calls you into a new adventure and you say, you know what, I don't know if I can trust you with this. This is a Thomas week. This is a seven days. And I don't know when Jesus is going to make it more clear to you. I don't know how he's going to do that for you. But I wonder if you can go ahead and step out in faith. I wonder if you can actually say, okay, God, I am going to believe. I've not yet touched the scars. I've not yet actually seen all that I want to see. But truly, can I believe? Can I step out and be the one God has called me to be? Jesus addresses this. I don't know if you know this, but in this text, Jesus addresses you and he addresses me. He's talking about me and he's talking about you when he's talking to Thomas. He recognizes that in his grace, he comes to Thomas and says, okay, I'm going to give you what you need. I'm going to give you what you need to see in order to believe. But then he goes on and he talks about us. So think about this. All those years ago, 2,000 years ago, Jesus, just as in John 17, he prays for you. In John 20, he speaks about you. John chapter 20, verse 29. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not yet seen and yet have believed. This is who we are. I have never seen the Lord Jesus. I have never touched his scars. I have never looked into the face of God. But I know beyond a shadow of doubt by the grace of God and by his mercy that he's allowed me to enter into relationship with him that I am one who believes without seeing. And if you are a believer in Christ, you join me in that identity. You are one who has received Jesus Christ without seeing him. And Jesus says of you, Jesus says of me, blessed are you. Thomas, blessed are those who will see without believing. But again, I want you on this Easter day to distinguish between two phrases that can be easily brought together if we're not careful. But we need to keep them separate. Christians, by definition, because we are Christians, because we are Christ followers, believe in Jesus. 
Note the word in. We believe in Jesus. An entirely different subject. An entirely different subject is when you take the word in out of that sentence. And here is the question. Do you believe Jesus? So really the message this morning comes down to two questions depending on your relationship with God at this point. If you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, the question I need to ask you, out of love for you, because I long for you to have what I have. I long for you to have what those around you have, and that is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so here's the question for you. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe in Jesus the Christ? There's another question. And this question is for those of you who believe. Those of you who are Christians. Not by anything you've done, except believe in his grace. And he's given you this gift of salvation. And we therefore have answered the first question. Yes, I believe in Jesus the Christ. But we still have the second question. And we lay it before ourselves as we go to the text of John and we ask ourselves and I ask you do you believe Jesus so don't leave this place without answering one or other one or the other question whichever one applies to you at this state in your spiritual journey do you believe in Jesus and do you believe Jesus do you believe in Jesus? Do you have that faith in him? Or, or And do you actually believe him? Because for Christians to gather on a day like this and to celebrate his resurrection is a great reminder, one worth celebrating yearly, weekly, daily. And then it moves us into this other challenge of saying, okay, Okay, Jesus, I'm actually going to believe you on this one. I'm actually going to trust you on this one. So how I'd like to close out this service this morning is simply by allowing you the opportunity, offering you the opportunity to answer that question. Whichever one applies to you. Do you believe in Jesus? And do you believe Jesus? Thank you.